May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. St. John, chapter 16, verse 33. We are again confronted this week, as we were last week, by the farewell discourse of Jesus. It might focus our minds a bit to imagine our Lord speaking these words from a gallows or tied to a pole awaiting a firing squad. After all, death is stalking Christ even in these last hours. The very next chapter is his prayer before dying. The chapter after that is his betrayal and trial. The chapter after that is his public execution. Today, we are listening to the final portion of God the Son's death speech to his apostles, themselves sad and terrified and painfully unready for what is about to hit them. In this sermon to them and us then, Jesus places our hope in three realities. One, prayer. Two, the love of the Father. And three, the victory of Jesus. Every other hope is at best a signpost leading us towards the truth. But more likely is an illusion or half-measured solution for a problem we don't fully understand. As Christians, this reality should be obvious, but accepting that our only hope of getting out of this life alive is within these three realities, three realities where we are not the heroes but the saved, accepting that is always going to be an assault upon our pride, always. But pride is death. So it is to our advantage that God makes us face its destructiveness head on by revealing its utter powerlessness. No one was more proud than the Gentile and Jewish men who murdered the world's Savior. But like all pride, theirs withered to nothing in the face of those two forces all humans must serve, death and sacrificial love. All those prideful men are dead. Christ is alive. Nothing else should matter to people who are dying. Right? Nothing else here should matter to people who imminently face their own demise. That love, however, that sacrificial love, that saving love, is only more powerful than pride because of its creator and its object. Prayer, the prayer described by our Lord today, prayer is powerful for the same exact reason. Jesus tells the apostles that through his sacrifice and return to his Father, redeemed humanity will enjoy a new kind of relation to its creator. Jesus will return to the Father, and he'll forever answer that haunting question in Genesis 3. After the fall of man, God goes out and he asks Adam, where are you? Where are you? Not because God doesn't know where Adam is, but giving Adam a chance to confess and come forward and be reunited. A chance he ignores. He hides. Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus, as both Son of Man and Son of God, will return to heaven to answer that question for humanity. When God asks, where are you? The Son says, here I am. And so when we pray to the Father through Christ, as our advocate and mediator, as the living embodiment of the true power of human love, we are calling upon the restored and improved relation, the second Adam, Jesus won when he died for Eve, won when he died for the church. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to be a part of. 
But we cannot confuse what it means to ask the Lord for help in our helplessness. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are placing ourselves under the authority of God. Just as the eternal word did when he humbled himself to save the world, when he emptied himself, as Paul says in Philippians 2. The Father is not our genie or our employee just waiting for us to call so we can snap into action. No. When we are praying in the name of God the Son, when those words come out of our mouths, it is as if we are being led into the royal throne room of the universe by the King's Son himself, (coughs) only to be informed by the King that we are to address him as Father. (coughs) God created fathers so that we might have some understanding of what it means to have an eternal Father who will never let us down. A Father who will never, because of weakness or malice, allow His children to be less than they were created to be. You often think of it as sort of the other way around. It is an unfortunate modern custom to avoid calling God Father. One adopted over the last few decades for theoretically a good reason, right? I mean, many people do have terrible fathers. And so it is said we shouldn't use that word lest all those people be reminded of their fathers who have failed them. Of course, What those misguided revisionists are missing is that human fathers have been failing their children from the beginning of time. That's not a new thing. The Bible is full of imperfect and downright terrible fathers. And yet, and yet, the Son commands that we use that word. He (coughs) commands us to use the word Father to describe the first person of the Blessed Trinity. Because the only thing, only that, that great eternal Father can heal those lingering wounds which reside in the hearts of all imperfect fathers and in the hearts of all the children, they inevitably fail. There are no perfect human fathers. If you think you are a perfect human father, let's talk afterwards. There's only one perfect Father, the Father who will never, ever fail us. If that hurts our pride, that's awesome, that's great. All the better. Because there's no room for pride in reality. It doesn't matter. But there is something greater. There's abundant, abundant, never-ending forgiveness and healing and strength from the Father greater than any pain or sorrow we can inflict or can be inflicted upon us. That's much better than all that pride nonsense. And that is what we ask for. That is what we are coming to when we humble ourselves in prayer before the name of Christ. We assassinate pride by denying our right to riches or glory. We, in fact, deny that we have any right to anything by humbly denying our very selves in favor of elevating the loving, obedient sacrifice of Christ above our hollow accomplishments and temporary glory. In that heavenly throne room, that place our hearts go when we pray, holding up our own achievements would be like running into the quarterback, Tom Brady, in an elevator, and bragging to him about how well our fantasy football team is doing. He doesn't care. No one actually cares, really, to be honest. Um, Blessedly, though, Tom Brady isn't God. Sometimes he seems to think he might be when you hear him in interviews, but he really isn't, actually. He's going to die, I promise. Um, He isn't God. Um, And that's a good thing. Because God does actually incredibly care about every single part of our lives. He cares about the hairs in your head, the feathers of a sparrow. He really does care. But, unless our resume includes this line, lived a sinless life and died for the sins of our apostate race, 
thereby reversing the curse of death and saving the world. Unless that's on your resume, we should understand just how crucial it is that we are more and more united to the Lord who makes our prayers something more than just a selfish wish list of last resort. There stands the key to all our prayers. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. They all must come from a heart united with the salvific mission of Christ so that when we pray, we pray for things which advance the kingdom of God in our world. This reality explains why Christ can say that incredible thing that began our gospel reading today. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. If we are truly asking the Father in the name of the Son, we will be asking for the tools and supplies for the fight against evil. And that, I hate to tell you, probably doesn't include a new yacht, right? Or any of the other silly things we think we have to have. Instead, in those prayers, we will be praying for deliverance from our enemies, food on our tables, clothes on our backs, not because comfort is the ultimate end in life, but so that we can better serve God, who mercifully provides all the things we need until he calls us home to where our entire existence will be one answered prayer. Prayer, then, as Jesus has laid it out for us, has a very specific purpose. We pray for victory, and we pray for joy in that victory. Now, we Anglicans take prayer very seriously, because the Bible takes prayer very seriously, but it's in our heritage. There are, of course, times in which we sigh in our exhaustion and confusion and just go, God, help me. And the Lord knows all that we need. There's no doubt about that. But when we gather together, whether at our church or at our home, we pray prayers not written by us, but prayers carefully constructed and preserved to make even praying for our daily needs and concerns more about how great God is than about how great the preacher is or prayer leader is. You may not have ever thought of this, but liturgy covers up our pride, just like vestments do, right? That's why we wear it. Covers our pride. That is why they've existed in the worship of God's people for 4,000 years. We need that humility like we need water, like air, and we need that humility. We need a place that tells us we're not the most important thing place not trying to sell us one more thing. Anyone who thinks it is rote or boring to daily say or sing the Psalms or read the Bible or join with the generations who came before us in prayers made immortal by being the last thing on the lips and hearts of saints and martyrs, anyone who thinks that is boring has not found a fault in the worship of God's people but they have found as a fault in their own soul, a part of their person where a prideful heart still seeks entertainment and novelty rather than truth and beauty and immortality. It exists in all of us. It's, in, it's everywhere around us all the time telling us to seek that out. And this place says no. Why is that in us? It was put there by evil. Humility is its enemy. Common prayer in the name of Jesus Christ is its executioner. And our pride does need to be destroyed. I can't say that enough. But what is so haunting about today's gospel is not the glorious good news of the new age of grace in which we now live. An age in which we can approach the throne of God as sons and daughters. That's not the bad news here, right? Nor is it the declaration of the Father's specific love for each and every single one of us. That's not, that's, that's all great. We're 100% on board when Jesus says those things. No, the sadness and warning of today's gospel comes from the ignorant, prideful confidence of the pre-Pentecost apostles and that devastating question 
from their Lord. Right? Remember, this is the end of the three-year training course these men have been going to, the end of this long farewell discourse. In the end, you have this final great revealing of Jesus' identity where he tells them, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. This great moment where he reveals who he is. And the apostles respond to this three-year unveiling by saying, we believe that you came from God. Does that seem like enough? Right? Where's the worship? Where's the songs? Where's the falling on their knees? Where's the hosannas, the hallelujahs, something? We believe that you came from God. John is hoping we remember where we've heard those words before. This isn't the first time someone said that to Jesus. Remember way back in in, in St. John chapter 3 when Nicodemus skulks in the dark and goes to Jesus and says, what does he say to him? We know you came from God. The same thing the apostles say. Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for saying those words. Because Jesus is so much more than that, right? He's not just someone who's come from God. He's the creator. He's God himself. How much, how painful must that have been to Jesus to hear that come from his apostles? Those words, Nicodemus. After three years, and a whole sermon about who he is, unaided human reason and wounded human nature miserably fail to recognize the voice of its very creator talking to them across a fire. That's incredible. Jesus responds to their overconfident creed with that rhetorical question, the same, really connected in a lot of ways to that same question God asked in the Garden of Eden. Jesus asks them, do you now believe? That question should haunt us, right? The idea that those men didn't, right? The king of kings looks out at the men who should know him the best, and he says, do you now believe? Nobody answers. He tells them the answer to that question, right? Did you notice that today? He tells these men who say they believe that they will abandon Jesus to die. So those words are nice, but their actions will reveal that they fear death more than God. Their actions will reveal that they love their own short lives more than the eternal word who is offering them eternal life. That's a heck of a thing. But it's the next words of Jesus that blow my mind. What does he say next? You're going to leave me. You're all going to abandon me. Yet I am not alone. The Father is with me. At that moment, we get a picture of our entire existence and what it means to be alone, to meet, means to have someone on our side. When the whole world, including his own disciples, think Jesus has been conquered, the presence of the Father declares the opposite. It declares he is the conqueror. When he's on the cross, that's all he needs. He doesn't need us. He has the Father declaring him victor. The Trinity, amazing in this whole story, right? They're going to use the fear and ignorance of the apostles, the evil bloodlust of the Romans, the self-righteous jealousy of the unbelieving Jews. It's going to use all of that to save the world, right? And so whatever tribulation God's people will face in the age of the church, whatever horror the dying world inflicts upon us, Whatever verse in Revelation or headline in the Wall Street Journal makes us afraid, none of it can destroy us as long as we are united to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says he is overcoming the world, we should thank God every day that our ignorant and selfish hearts are included in that world he is overcoming. We should thank God every day that Jesus Christ has revealed that all of our earthly pride was just preening insanity. And we can get rid of it. Get it off our backs. Don't have to worry about it anymore. We should thank God every day that the victory of Christ on the cross does not belong to Christ alone. But that all the humble, penitent, praying hearts of men are united with him in that triumph forever. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.